go. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are really excited to have Ben Waddell from the Fruit Growers Lab, which is a wonderful company in Ventura County that um, does a lot of really great things. They have supported our school gardens by doing um, soil testing for free for the schools. And they've been really helpful to help us um, understand when we have challenges with our soil, they do an analysis for us too. So um, I'm gonna let him take it away. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Anna. So I wish I had a little bit more on the tech end for you guys. I'm actually doing this on my cell phone. My, uh, my network wasn't wanting to let me connect. So, um, but here oh. I am. Um, yes, I'm, I'm currently at the lab, I'm in my office, but um, yeah, so Fruit Growers Lab, um, you know, we've been an agricultural lab for, oh gosh, something like 95 years in Ventura County now. Um, got started quite a while, quite a while back, 1925, I believe. Um, and started as a, um, basically a co-op for citrus growers in the area. Um, oh, some... 35 years ago, we incorporated, um, changed from being a co-op to a for-profit um, company, expanded to now we're covering the whole state of California, Western Seaboard, as well as international um, uh, locations. We have five labs in the state um, serving both agricultural and now environmental needs. So in addition to doing all the agricultural work, we're also doing uh, regulatory environmental work, um, mostly in drinking water, wastewater. Uh, those those types of things. Uh, my role here is uh, I'm the director of agricultural services, so I I manage our agricultural department um, across all of our locations, um, but it's mostly handled out of here in Santa Paula. Um, my day to day, um, you know, it can range from being in the field collecting samples to meeting with clients and helping troubleshoot problems they may be seeing. Um, and, and this ranges across not just agricultural settings, but also homeowners, landscape, um, you know, pr private gardens, stuff like that. So it's it, there's uh, quite a few different aspects to it um, at the lab itself. Um, you know, probably the bread and butter, I would say, of our, our ag department um, is, is in tissue analysis. We do a lot of um, leaf, petiole, um, those types of tissues. Uh, across all crops, um, as well as landscape plants and other other non edibles, um, basically, you know, we analyze for nutrient status in those tissues, and and that's, you know, we might do four or five hundred samples a day or more at some of our peak times. So right now we're getting a lot of um, walnut, pistachio, and almond samples from the Central Valley. Um, you know, several hundred at a time coming in every day. Um, during the winter time, late late fall, all the way through winter, we're doing a lot of soil analysis, kind of what Anna mentioned, um, looking at um, current fertility status in the soil, how we can amend, how we can fertilize to optimize crop growth. Um, again, also for not just agricultural, but landscape and garden and, and all other um, you know, production aspects there. So um, that's pretty much the the bulk of what of what we do here um, we get into some other things like organic amendment analysis looking at manures and composts and um, weird things like uh, ground up cockroaches and fly larvae and funny things that people are doing all over the place um, composting has been kind of a big thing in the last couple of years so there's more and more interest there um, we also look at um, um, specific soil blends and 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 help kind of guide people on how they can optimize those situations um, but it's it's pretty we spend most of our time doing um, to kind of give you guys a little bit of background on on how I ended up here um, it's actually interesting um, I think I was aware of the farm to school program before I was aware of fruit growers lab um, <laughs> um, I was actually in school. I only graduated from college two years ago. Um, and uh, a, a buddy of mine, Anna, you probably remember Jared Logan. Yes, Jared's a good friend. Yeah, yeah. he's he's one of my close friends too. And I, I was actually coming out of a, a 10 or 12 year career in, in restaurant management and doing some other things and had gone back to school and, and he contacted me um, about writing him a letter of recommendation actually to come work for you guys this program. Yeah. So that was when I first heard about it. 
Um, I had no idea that, well, I knew about fruit growers, but I hadn't put much interest into them at the time. I was studying biology at Channel Islands here locally. So um, uh, I, you know, wrote them a letter of recommendation and, and it was always kind of in the back of my mind, like, oh, how cool. I wish they would have done something like that when I was going to Camarillo. And, you know, we had our ag, our ag department, but it, it was small and I didn't do anything with it at all. Um, so anyway, I'm kind of getting off track here, but, um, at the time I was in school, um, studying biology and had decided I wanted to become a pest control advisor, which is, a um, another big, um, ag career here in the area, kind of a, a good entry level, um, way into the industry. If you're not a, a, a long-term, um, generational farmer, if your family doesn't own property already, or, you know, any of those aspects of farming that seem, um, foreign to most of us because we're not all landowners but right. um so anyway i started on this pca program they they had the pathway to pca coursework out at channel islands already somewhat lined up so i was taking classes there um we had a, a pca local pca who does a lot of work with capca and knows knows us here at fruit growers pretty well also a family friend of mine oddly enough who came in and gave me the contact for scott Busey, who you know anna um, gave him a call and, and I was fortunate to find that they had an opening. Um, Scott was wanting to retire. They needed some help in the lab. So I spent a year working in the lab as a chemist um, while also learning some field work and, and getting a feel for, for how ag functions. And uh, when Scott retired, I spent about six months uh, while well, leading up to his retirement training under him and doing a lot of field work with him and our field staff. Um, and, and now that he's mostly retired i'm i'm also doing the people management and, and running the, the the lab side of it as well so um it's been a crazy couple of years um that's in, a cool story yeah and amongst all that i also had a kid got married um and did all the you know all the other life things that you know happen sometimes faster than you're expecting <laughs> um, but it's all been really good i'm really fortunate to have fgl this is a really great company um I've learned a ton and I'm still constantly learning. Um, just prior to getting on this call, I got a call from some citrus guys down in um, uh, Coachella Valley who are mostly lemons down there. And um, we had a long conversation about issue sampling and nutrient ranges and all these things that six months ago, I probably wouldn't have been able to answer half of those questions. So it's, it's been, it's been interesting. Um, I've also recently, um, well, six months ago or so, pass my certified crop advisor test and I'm waiting, waiting on that certification to be finalized COVID-19 as I'm sure you guys are always really throwing a wrench into programs. Um, so that slowed things down on that, but it's one extra certification, kind of another feather in the hat that'll work um, uh, to my advantage, you know, in this career. So um, yeah, that's kind of my story. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or is curious about anything, you know, jump in anytime. That's a great happy story. To ask questions or answer so questions. Do you travel? Because I know Fruit Growers Lab, you guys have, there's like, they're kind of throughout the state. There's a, are there at least? Am I yeah, wrong? so we're in San Luis Obispo, Stockton, Chico, and Visalia okay. are our satellite facilities. Those locations are set up primarily as bacteriological labs and sample collection points. We run field crews out of there. Um, they do a lot of environmental work, particularly out of Stockton, San Luis Obispo. Um, Visalia spends a lot of time doing ag work, but they also have a good amount of environmental clients as well. So, um, but we have them set up as bacteriological labs um, so they can do what we call short hold time. Some samples, they have to be um, essentially on an instrument or, or being analyzed within a certain number of hours. It's just not feasible to get a sample from Sacramento to Santa Paula in six hours. Can't even drive it that fast. So, yeah. um, so we have those to, to or customer needs in those regions um, and the question is do I travel and, and yes I do um, this year has been much less than the couple of years past um, a vast majority of my traveling is sorry I got a call there um, oh, okay. can you guys hear me yeah uh, a, a vast majority of my traveling is for um, uh, trade shows and other conferences and continuing education type stuff. 
Um, I do occasionally go to helpful sampling. Um, I don't do a lot of customer outreach um, specifically in some of the more distant areas unless we've planned it all out and are, are going to do a, a bunch in, in one trip. Um, the last two years we've been doing um, what we call our grower appreciation continuing education events where we go set up a conference and bring in some of our clients and do talks and stuff like that. Um, so I do travel for those. Um, but I, I'm plenty busy just here in Santa Paula and, and, and have field guys in our, our other locations that kind of are my eyes and my ears and I spend a lot of time through email on the phone helping troubleshoot in some of our distant areas. Um, hopefully once all this COVID stuff settles down, we do have some trips planned up through Sacramento Stockton area for some customer outreach and um, trying to do some training meetings with some of the guys up there kind of helping remind them why they sample, how they sample, um, how to best utilize the data that we generate for them, those, those kinds of things. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's double-edged. There's definitely um, a business building aspect to that, but also, you know, we're wanting to help these guys out. Um, we feel that our work is, um, is, real, is real big in, in helping the environment and helping out farmers maximize their productivity while minimizing their inputs and um, you know, it saves them money. Um, it, it makes the regulators happy, um, you know, turning their attention to water quality issues and things that are becoming more and more important these days um, is is good work. Um, and I, I'm, I feel really good about it. It's nice to be a part of that um, and, and being a part of it on on a, um, you know, mostly um, independent side you know we're not regulators and we're not industry really we're, we're industry but we're not we're not growers we're just simply the data generators showing them where they stand and how they can do things better um while not trying to sell them fertilizer uh, <laughs> um so um so we're we're really proud of that um not not all labs can say that and uh, I, I think it's a it's a good thing so so in other words you guys are non-biased and you don't really have non <clears throat> an agenda other than to do right by your client who's the farmer and so exactly. um, yeah. which might make you different than other maybe labs that do different perhaps yeah i i think maybe the you guys i think maybe the biggest difference is and um sometimes we get to be the bearer of bad news you know we're not always going to tell them what they want to hear sometimes mm -hmm. they just need to hear what the what the, the facts of the situation are and if that means they're crops are struggling because they're not fertilizing enough, then so be it. And we have to tell them that we're not just going to tell them, yeah, you need to apply more because we have it on sale for you. <laughs> that, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, um, I want to show. So while you were talking, I found an old report. Um, this is from 2016. I can't believe I've been doing this this long, <laughs> but um, I'm going to share my it with the students so they can see it. Awesome. Um, yeah. So let's see if you guys can see this. Yes. It's like a PDF. <clears throat> Can you guys see it or no? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is from um, the channel. This is from Channel Islands High School. So we did, we built a garden there on this like empty dirt lot um, at the school. And so um, someone who works at the company named Jamie Johnson, he came and he did oh, yeah. uh, samples of the soil. And then they took it back to their lab and they ran an analysis on the soil we gave them. And this is what they told us. So um, they told us our nitrogen was low, which isn't surprising. There was nothing at the time, there was nothing growing on this piece of like land, right? Um, but we had a lot of calcium, no doubt probably from like our water supply, I'm imagining. Um, but they gave us this huge like printout of all of the nutrients in our soil and all of the micronutrients. And overall, you know, we kind of determined, well, our soil is like pretty, it was pretty good there. And we, that's one of the reasons why it's been such a successful garden. Um, our garden at Rancho Campana has struggled. I need to find, I have a report for that one too. Um, but they're showing us like the salinity in the soil, which is, you know, was kind of a, a problem area. Um, and I think we all determined that that was probably from the water. Our municipal water has a lot of, um, has a lot of issues, but, um, it's, it's really interesting to be able I just pulled your report up right here on my server. I've got it here. On my oh, okay. Too. Um, it's, uh, 
it's really interesting to be able to look at a soil and, and start to understand um, maybe how it's been treated um, in the past, uh, maybe how it's been used um, after looking at, you know, what amounts to hundreds, maybe thousands of these things over the last couple of years, um, you kind of start putting the pieces together on historical use. Um, I can tell by looking at a lot of soils, if they've been farmed at all, um, you know, it's, it's really easy to get a feel for different regions and what their native soils look like. And um, it's, it's really, to me, especially having a, um, a biology and chemistry background, um, it's really interesting to see these things and then take that information, turn it into an actionable plan and, and move forward. Um, and then with, you know, a lot of our clients, it's their year over year, and, uh, you know, sometimes multiple times a year and looking at historical data and how things are changed and what we've told them to do. Um, it, it's, you know, it's kind of like a puzzle and it's, it's fun. Um, I, I garden at my own house too. So I, I do a similar thing in my own backyard, but, um, it's really interesting. Um, and it's, it, it can be rewarding. It's not just as simple as, um, you know, dragging a tractor across the ground and sticking mm -hmm. some plants in it mm -hmm. four months later, pulling food out. Right. Right. Absolutely. And then, so the analysis you guys do for tree, like for fruit trees, if I was like an avocado grower and I had a disease on my trees and I didn't know what to do, like would I bring in like samples of the leaves and the fruit and the bark to you or what would I do? Well, so it, it depends. Um, if you're just checking um, fertility status within within the tree itself, um, we would we would collect a, a specific age range leaf from a from a particular part of the tree at the right time of year. So typically with avocados in this area, you're looking at um, mid August, late August, September, October time. Uh, we like to collect leaves and analyze them for um, primary, secondary, and micronutrient levels. The reason we take the leaves at a certain time is because there's research that's been done um, primarily through the UC system that tells us what the optimum range of those nutrients should be at that time of year. Mm -hmm. um, that's largely used as a kind of check in their yearly production. So you take your, your late summer, early fall tissue sample, you see where you ended up and you make adjustments in the following year's fertility schedule. If you needed to add a little more nitrogen early on, those kinds of things. Um, we would supplement that data with a soil analysis in the winter just to see what the soil resource is holding. And you, then you make your modifications year over year until you reach the levels that you want to be. If you're seeing um, disease symptoms or some kind of a physiological issue in the tree, whether it's tip burn or um, uh, chlorosis or, or yellowing of the leaves, those types of things, then we can take soil and or um, tissue analysis at those times to help diagnose that problem. But we'll also get into cultural aspects. Um, how are you irrigating? Um, what's your water quality like? Um, have there been any um, weather changes, high heat, high, high wind, cold, those types of things that might be causing these problems to, to be you know, present. Um, if there's a very obvious disease that's present, then we can sample wherever that disease is, is showing itself. Typically with avocados, that's going to be in the roots. Um, we'll dig roots and look for what's called Phytophthora cinnamomy or avocado root rot. Um, there's also Phytophthora citr citricola, um, that would be avocado crown rot, which is at the base of the trunk. We can sample for those. Um, I'll culture them in a petri dish here in the lab um, and do a, um, a physical identification under a microscope of, of that pathogen um, to confirm or deny its presence. And then the growers can make um, uh, treatment plans moving forward based on that information. Um, so, you know, it's not always as straightforward as just kind of collect everything and, and start testing it. Um, we do get that guys call me. I had a guy a couple months ago, call me and say, I have 70 acres of new avocado trees and a lot of them are dying. Can I bring you a whole tree? And, and it was, a you know, kind of a laughable moment, but at the same time, it was a teachable moment for him. Like, no, it actually turned out it was easier for me to go to him and, and see what was happening in the field. But, um, 
in that particular situation. We He's were like, at, help me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were, you know, you're talking about, this isn't hundreds of dollars, this is hundreds of thousands of dollars right, of just trees. Of yeah. um, not even not even considering the labor and everything that had already been got put oh. into these one-year-old trees, so. Yeah, that's awful. That's terrifying <laughs> as a fur farmer, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, now, Don wants but, to know, when you test the soil, do you also check the nutrients like um, nitrogen, potassium, What's K? What do you think? What's the MPK stands for uh, nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium. Okay. Phosphate and potassium. Yeah. So in the, are you asking about in the soil? Yeah. He's yeah. Asking so the soil. They do a full rundown. I don't know if you, I'll send you guys the, our printout, um, our reports from CI and Rancho. I think I have the Rancho one somewhere so you guys can see it, but they do a full rundown like a diagnostic they're kind of like the doctors for a farm like when you have like a health issue they're just like I, I kind of view you guys that way yeah so we you know when we do a soil analysis the primary and secondary nutrients so primary nutrients are going to be your nitrate nitrogen phosphate phosphorus potassium and we do a couple different types of potassium well one kind of potassium but we're looking at what's called the exchangeable fraction and the soluble fraction and um, and, and, you know, looking at those levels, um, what you're basically trying to do is, is determine what's available to the crop. You cross-reference that to what your crop's demand is going to be. Um, and that's usually done by looking at what your potential yield is, age of the crop, um, those types of things. Um, and, and you can use that information to modify your fertilizer inputs. Um, and this is becoming really important, particularly with the nitrogen uh, due to water quality issues, um, groundwater uh, contamination with nitrogen is a big problem in a lot of places. Um, it's rendered a lot of wells in different parts of the state unusable due to um, the hazards of drinking high nitrate water. Um, so growers are, are, are really being pressed now to pay attention to these things. Um, in the state we now have, and this has been a, a slow roll for the last, you know, six or eight years, um, nitrogen management plans where growers have to plan out their year, um, provide documentation on what their anticipated yield is, um, how much water they're applying, what the nitrogen content of that water already is, uh, and, and basically plan out what they're going to apply. And then at the end of the year, they have to go and rec reconcile um, what they did apply, what they harvested, how much they were over or under, and keep record of all that. Um, as we move further along into these regulatory um, uh, pathways, so more or less, uh, there's going to be enforcement on, on these types of documents and, and growers will have to be accountable for the nitrogen they're putting on. Um, just north of us here, Santa Barbara County, up through Salinas Valley, Monterey County, all up in there, the Central Coast region, um, they have some very strict rules and it's um, if I was a farmer um, in that area right now, um, I, I, w I would be um, thinking about selling, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, you know, they're, they're looking at some really stringent rules that are, that are challenging, and we're doing a lot of work with the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board right now, um, helping them implement some of these upcoming changes to their, to their ag order. And um, it's, it's really... Uh, um, well, that's where all of the contamination is coming from, though, right? It's like when they have an outbreak of E. coli, it comes from Salinas. Um, so, you know, am I wrong? Yeah. So, e. and we think and, it's because and, that's also where you have, like, you know, you, you hear about all the, um, no, um, you, you hear about all the, the food safety things and, and these big E. coli outbreaks and, um, you know, there's, you could point your finger at a lot of different issues there. Water is certainly one of them. Um, but it's the uh, animal wild animals and other like things getting out into the fields, I think, is another part of it. Um, yeah. And they're definitely. Sorry. Near, well, it's like, nearby. it's like. The yeah. Yeah. So there have been. Oh. <laughs> You're cutting out there. Sorry. So it's like the animal farms are really close to, say, where they're growing spinach or um, romaine lettuce, right? And that's that runoff from those animal farms gets into the water systems. And so 
Um, yeah. But this is interesting for the students to consider. So what we that, do, um, this oh, is. Go ahead. Go ahead. This is a big part of of what our water analyses are looking at. We do. We're, you know, we look at. Um, we're looking at, uh, um, we, and we do a lot of this, what they call our, our, our we call it a GAP back T, or GAP stands for Good Agricultural Practices. We basically analyze water for bacterial load. Um, we're looking at fecal coliform, E. coli, um, you know, potentially pathogenic bacteria in water, and, and a lot of farmers are, they are required to keep record of these water analyses on on the farm as part of their um, good agricultural practices certification. Um, is it going to catch everything? No, but it'll bring awareness to potential issues that are arising. Um, and I, that kind of all falls into some of that, you know, that feel good work that we do that we know we're helping by by participating in. Um, and it's there's a lot more uh, I guess pressure you could say being put on some of these farmers to do this stuff because of public perception and mm -hmm. the fear of our food being contaminated with pathogens right. um, and we're gonna we're gonna see more of it um, it's it's not going away it's not gonna lighten up um, it's it's gonna be more and more um, but it, it brings up an interesting point you know as a lab we in a sense benefit from these high regulatory loads. Um, you know, when the government comes in and says, now you need to test for X, Y, and Z, um, you know, we take a lot of pride in being able to step up and say, we can do that, we're here for you, um, and how can we help? Um, but it also does something um, kind of both on the regulatory side and on the, and on the agricultural side where it drives the development of new positions. Um, it, it, it makes a need for more people, um, more well-educated people who understand these things and how these systems work um, to help the farmers um, make good decisions, um, you know, consulting and, and being educated in, in how to mitigate problems, how to identify problems. Um, that's going to really be a huge thing, um, you know, in the next number of years. Um, it's already a big thing and it's gonna to continue to grow. Um, and it just opens up the door to a lot more agricultural type jobs um, that are above and beyond the kind of perceived farmer stereotype. Um, right, which, right. Um, it, it, you know, depending on where you stand in the industry, it could be a good thing or a bad thing. A lot of guys are very opposed to the regulation. They're very opposed to having to do the extra work and spend the extra money. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's really a sign of the development of the industry. Right. Absolutely. Gosh, I'm so glad you said all of that, um, because I think, you know, the message for students and I agree with you. So food safety students is like this new there's a new law that the government has been passing for years and they keep extending it. Anna, you're breaking up quite. I don't know. Oh, OK. Students, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so this food safety is like this new law that the government has been working on. It's called the Food Safety Modernization Act, and it's requiring farmers to to basically test their water supply like Ben's talking about and test their soil, come up with a food safety plan that basically is showing responsibility on the part of the grower to say that we are growing our food responsibly, we're making sure that the food is safe and not contaminated, and it's safe for people to eat, in a nutshell. Um, and so I think up until now, work that they do at Fruit Growers Lab has been, um, farms are looking at ways to improve their crops, to make it more product, to make their crops more productive, right? Um, but I think with this change in food safety laws, there's going to be in the next like 10, 20 years, probably a huge increase in people who do the work that there's going to be a bigger demand for jobs like what Ben and his coworkers do at Fruit Growers Lab because farms, um, they're now going to be required to do all of the testing that he's talking about. Um, and it's just a completely like new way it's like a new way of thinking for farms. Um, I tell the students, I have, I have a whole lot of farming family and they, um, 
you know, I ask them how often they test their soil and they'll say, we only test the soil when there's a problem and we don't have any problems. And so we don't test our soil and we know where the water, they know where the water is coming from because they have a well on their farm and they pump it. But um, when this law comes into effect, and that's just a very common way for farmers to think, but when this law comes into effect, like they're going to have to, um, they're going to have to start testing their water and their, and their soil and doing these things that he's talking about. Um, he's coming back. <laughs> um, yeah, that's super interesting, Ben. Um, so John wants to know, how do we know when to add certain nutrients to the soil? So that's largely based off of, well, first you, it, depending on which crop you're, you're dealing with, um, that's number one, uh, number two, which nutrient you're specifically talking about. So, um, you know, obviously the, the main ones here are going to be your nitrogens, your phosphorus and your potassium adds. Now, um, we apply nitrogen based on crop need. Um, we have a um, kind of a saying, it's, it's a, um, they call it the four R's and it's, uh, has to do with the right place, the right time, the right source and the right amount of fertilizer. And nitrogen is really important on this one because you can't just go, you know, let's just say, for example, your avocado grove needs 95 pounds of nitrogen for the year. You don't go out in March and put 95 pounds of nitrogen on the ground because by June, most of that's going to be gone and the crop's going to have not taken up any of it. It's going to all wash down into the soil, rinse off with, you know, irrigation water. Um, so what you do is you space out those applications through known periods of crop uptake. With avocados, it's our understanding that starting in June or July, they have a, a good root flush in this area and they're going to take up more of those nutrients. So you'll make your additions at that period of time that allows for optimum uptake of the nutrient in question. When you start getting into the phosphoruses and the potassiums, calcium, some of the secondaries, those types of nutrients, they don't act the same way in the soil as, as nitrogen does. They tend to stick around a little bit longer. So you may go out and make an addition um, March or April when you're doing some of your early season prep or um, some of your, you know, maybe your spreading manure or whatever the operation is calling for. You can put those in the soil now. You would do your late summer, early fall tissue analysis and see if you got a response or if your levels are what you're expecting. And if not, you can go back and either make another addition um, spray some foliarly onto the leaves, avocados, not so much, but um, other crops, um, and then adjust going into the next year. Um, so, and that's with permanent crops. With row crops, um, you know, they a lot of times do a pre-plant um, amendment. They'll go in and they'll put certain amounts in prior to planting um, and then do tissue analysis as the, um, as the season progresses and make adjustments on the fly. Um, so it's really not a straightforward answer. It's not um, just apply it at the beginning of the year and, and hope you had enough. It's, it's all about monitoring, um, understanding the development of the crop, um, what we call the crop phenology um, and how its growth goes um, and trying to apply as efficiently as possible. It's a great answer. <laughs> Are you in the lab right now? I'm in my office in the lab. Yeah. Can you like, can you like show them pictures? Are you allowed to? Yeah. No? I, I can take you guys out. Let me see if I can turn okay. my, um, turn my camera around. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Let me take you out there. Thank you. Lab, the lab's not as exciting as you might think. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a soils lab, so it's quite messy. Kind of give you a little video tour here. So let's see. Okay. So this is our, our soils lab area. Um, you see kind of these are our filtration stations where they make the extracts and do the filters. Um, you know, various reagents lined along the benches here. Um, this is one of our soil chemists. She's doing a chloride analysis. Um, more, more prep areas, see it's rather scattered, but 
these are more more filtration stations for doing uh, saturated paste of soils um, take you back here and show you our grinding room and stuff it's going to be a little loud so they're let me get out of the noise here they're back there grinding tissues um, that we've received over the last couple days this is where i do all my actually here i got some i can show you my little microbiology station here this is a an incubator uh, let's see here so these are these are uh, citrus root rot i just made these yesterday so i don't think we're going to see anything growing in there yet but um, this is looking for um, uh, looking for citrus root rot um, this is from a local a local orchard in ventura uh, let's see, let me move over to some of our instruments so you can see where some of the cool stuff happens. So this is what we call our Lico Lab. And these are, can you guys all hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so these are, um, these are what we call combustion analyzers. Um, I think, let's see if this one's not running right now, but basically what these do is these take a, a small sample aliquot that are put on these carousels, um, takes them in, burns them at about uh, 900 to 1000 degrees Celsius, um, so pretty high, and spits out data. Um, so this is a screen, um, this particular analyzer is looking at percent nitrogen, percent carbon, and percent sulfur, um, and it can be done on both tissue and soil. Um, Actually, is it running? It doesn't look like it is. So anyway, um, you know, these are being ran almost 24 hours a day, constantly doing something. Here's another one. This is another Leco combustion analyzer. This instrument's older than probably all of you guys combined. <laughs> um, but this is this is looking at percent nitrogen, total nitrogen in, in plant tissues. Um, so that one, these these are our workhorses. These things are, are constantly being used. We have two of them. Um, really important and probably one of the most abundant an analyses we do is a, a nitrogen analysis and we just got hey dave what's up i haven't seen him we just got this is one of our newest instruments we just got this one installed in the last couple of days it's another combustion analyzer um, as you can see the tech on these is um, uh, quite a bit more advanced than some of the older ones yeah that looks um, fancy yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so they're still setting this one up, but it, it'll do much the same as what that other one's doing, just with better technology, easier to use, easier to access and maintain. Um, this is all a job in and of itself, and we have our, our lab manager runs all these. Um, quite a bit of work that goes into it. Um, and, and believe it or not, that's pretty much everything. Um, we have one other lab space. Um, it's really loud in there. I don't think you guys will be able to hear me, but that's where we do our... Uh, micronutrient analysis on on both tissue and soil so um, and that's done on what's called an ICP or an induction coupled plasma um, analyzer essentially so that's pretty much the lab um, I, I can show you one more quick thing here okay this is awesome thank you yeah no problem so these are all of our drying ovens uh, we got a whole bank of them here it's on both sides um, all of our um, soil and tissues will be put in here at different temperatures, dried overnight before being ground. Um, another pretty minor but critical part, you know, without being able to dry all the samples properly, we wouldn't be able to analyze them. So, um, and then the other whole half of the building is all of our uh, um, environmental stuff. So we've got over there a radio, uh, radiological lab looking at um, radioactive components of water. Um, we have a bacteriological lab doing all of our bacteriological analyses for drinking waters, waste waters. Um, we have our wet chem, same thing. It does um, drinking waters, irrigation waters. It goes on and on. We have a pretty long list. I can actually, if you, <laughs> you could probably find our list on the, on the website, but there's hundreds of different analyses you can you can choose from. So it's uh, it's it's pretty in depth. Wow. John has more questions. He's our, sure. he's our class gardener. Um, awesome. says, when you collect samples of soil, how many samples do you collect from one farm or property? 
So we base that off the, a couple things. Number one, probably biggest is the size. Um, in a perfect world, you could go out and, and sample every 10 feet and, and have a really, really huge data set. Um, but in reality, that's time and cost ineffective. So um, I typically recommend, if possible, to sample about once, one what we call a composite sample per about 10 to 20 acres would be ideal. Um, we'll stretch that to about 40 acres if, if it's a consistent area. Um, unless you're out on the Oxnard Plain, um, you don't have a lot of consistency in this area when we spend a lot of time with the avocados and citrus guys up in the foothills. Um, lots of topography, hills, valleys, all those things going on. So now we got start getting into um, you'll sample different aspects. So if you have a south-facing slope, you'll sample that area as one. You might sample the top and the bottom separately, those types of things. Generally speaking, for a 40-acre farm, um, you're looking at anywhere from one to about six soil samples that are collected as a composite, which could mean anywhere from 15 to 150 different cores being pulled from the soil and put into a bucket mixed together. Um, to give you as uniform as a sample as you can as you can get. So we've been too, just so students you guys know, once we're once you're back at school and you're able to go back into your science classes, um, the farm to school team, we um, purchased like little soil testing kits. They're oh, definitely cool. not as fancy as as what they have here in the lab, but um, we've been working with different biology teachers, environmental science teachers um, to do soil testing and show students how they can do it because, it is possible to do like a, a light version of a soil test at home. Um, and we just purchased um, some core. So like it's like this uh, metal thing and it goes down and it takes the core. Um, so that way we can have a couple of those too. Worth every penny. Yeah, we're excited. Um, and then we purchased, we're working on getting water filters to filter our water from the, because we're just using like municipal water so we can filter yeah. out some of the, the bad stuff in it um very good yeah <laughs> we're trying slowly but surely hey that's um, that's the key <laughs> do you guys have any more questions this was really really interesting i think this is this was really cool students also quiet um yeah what i love is that this is a side of, of agriculture that's focused on focused on science entirely. So for all of our kids who like science, um, you know, this is something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, there's so many aspects to the science that, that I think go unrecognized. What really got me into it, aside from being a gardener and, and enjoying this stuff, you know, on my own prior to getting an ag, um, what really piqued my interest into agriculture was insects. Um, and I was, a, like I said, I was a biology student, um, and one of my elective options was entomology. Um, and that class, I loved every second of it. I like couldn't wait to go to that class every week. And um, I learned a ton. I, I, it's almost like one of those classes I took, get an A in it, and feel like you didn't even do any work because you enjoyed it so much. Um, and it's such a massive part of ag, you know, understanding insects. Mm -hmm. um, understanding how they affect our crops and those types of things is huge. And it's also probably one of the higher paying aspects of ag too, because it's just so important. Um, and so, you know, there's that direction. And then there's the chemistry side. You know, if you're in the math and chemistry, then there's, you know, a ton of that going on with nutrient interactions and fertilizers. And it just goes on and on. It's, it's really not just as simple as, um, you know, understanding plants. There's a lot more to it. Um, right. So, you know, don't don't shortchange yourself, um, you know, when you're when you're choosing school and, and looking at classes that are, you know, out there to take, you know, Ventura College has got a great ag program that they fired back up. And I'm really looking forward to where they go with that. Um, it doesn't have to be completely ag centric. There's a lot of auxiliary type of sciences that go around with it that um, that are equally as fun and equally as rewarding uh, and and it leaves the door open for um, you know getting into the industry learning a bunch and and even transitioning into other industries that use similar knowledge so um, you know that's I'm, I'm actually one of the one of the few that I work with that don't have an ag degree people kind of look at me like you have a biology degree how are you why are you working in ag but uh, it seems to work just fine so 
um, it's, it's really awesome. Yeah, it is. It's wonderful. Very, very good. Thank you. If you were in class, they would, they would be applauding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Does anybody else have any questions? I'm going to let him go. Okay. So nice to meet you. Oh, thank you. They're all saying thank you. Thank oh, you, Ben. Yeah. Really nice and, to meet you. And uh, feel free to share my email address and stuff with them, okay. too. If, if anybody has any questions, they can always reach out to me directly. Okay. Uh, and I'll always. send you the link to our video. <laughs> yeah, please do. Okay. Thank you for the tour and everything. It was wonderful. Uh, absolutely. Nice talking okay. to you. Bye, all Ben. Right. Bye. Okay, students. Um... I will wrap up our recording as well.